Hi, I'm Gordon Lanfear with the Real Finds Podcast. Real Finds Podcast interviews key entrepreneurs, scientists, and activists who are shaping the real estate industry and as a result, our world. In today's episode, we'll be talking to Anson Young from the Anson Young Property Group, Bigger Pockets, and the author of Finding and Funding Great Deals, the hands-on guide to acquiring real estate in any market. We'll discuss the makings of a great deal, flipping versus fur investing, and the rapidly evolving finance environment. Hey everyone, we have on the podcast today, Anson. He's um, one of the unique voices in real estate who's uh, both an author and an investor, as well as he's done a great job of simplifying a lot of the real estate game for folks who are just starting out. Anson, thank you for hopping on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. This is great. I appreciate that. So Anson, can you tell a little bit about yourself to somebody who might not have read your book or might not uh, be familiar? Of course. Um, I mean, I'm a real estate agent and investor based out of Denver. Um, I've done a lot of residential real estate, um, both on both sides, the agent side and the investor side, fix and flips, wholesales, um, some burrs, uh, long-term holds, and uh, have a lot of experience in REO, short sales, uh, direct to seller marketing is kind of our um, our bread and butter over here. And um, and yeah, and also wrote a book for Bigger Pockets uh, called Finding and Funding Great Deals, and have been super lucky to have been able to do that as well. Yeah, I mean, any any time that Bigger Pockets attaches to anybody in the real estate business, that's always a check mark of uh, <laughs> uh, of somebody being a pretty knowledgeable investor. Um, before we get into your real estate background, I think what's what's curious is you have a background in music. That's that's correct. I I do. Um, I I've been playing music since I was thirteen or so when my dad gave me a guitar that he had. Um, I'm not you know I, I'm not a Steve Vai like shredding you know God or anything like that. But I've I've been lucky enough to you know at, at certain times in my career have a basically be a semi professional musician in certain circles and. Um, yeah, that, that creative outlet is a huge part of uh, who I am. And so if it's not music, I've really dived into video this last uh, two years. And I enjoy that process just as much as I do music. So, um, so yeah, it, it is a kind of a unique thing. Yeah, and Anson, that's the reason why I ask. Because I, I think in my time in investing and in real estate, one of the things I've noticed is individuals that come from a musical background gives them a very unique both creative and mathematical approach to the world and i think that's important that our listeners know that you kind of have that that mental uh, aptitude um besides that um are you still into the uh the hardcore music life i know i know you i know at one point in my life i was a a, a big fan of corn metallica alice in chains all those classics um I, do you still throw it down every once in a while? Yeah, um, one of you know one of the things I do like to do on my spare time is go to shows, and so um, you know we'll we'll go to you know six to twelve shows a year and um, and have a lot of fun. And so it's still you know you're like the old guy at the show, so you're not in the mosh pit or anything, but you're you're enjoying you know bands that you've discovered or that you uh, that you used to you know really. Had, had a connection with it sometime in your past and you're there to still enjoy, you know, that music that's still coming out. Cause some of these guys are, you know, my age and they're still making full time, you know, living touring, which is amazing. So it is amazing. So there's another <laughs> amazing thing though, beyond your book, and that's going out and starting um, two businesses, Anson property group and uh, Anson publishing. What inspired you to kind of, you know, take that leap of faith and, uh, and, and start those businesses. I mean, yeah, the, the property group was, a was a product of, you know, starting to do fix and flips and I needed a tax vehicle or a vehicle to kind of just shove expenses into. Um, my wife has, uh, worked for a CPA for over 20 years. And so from minute one, you know, they're basically like, you need an LLC or you need some sort of structure to run, 
um, these, this business under. And so, um, so that was a very, you know, very early decision. Um, I think maybe my first property I ever bought was in my own name. And then after that was, you know, under the company. And, uh, and so thankfully uh, nothing crazy has happened with it. And it's been a good vehicle for that. And then it was kind of the same thing for publishing when I, uh, when I wrote the book and bigger pockets was like, Hey, who do we send these checks to? Is it your name or is it an LLC? And I go, I'll, I guess I better um, create a new LLC for this. And then under that though, I also do, um, any, any publishing or I guess media. And so if I'm getting paid for, um, speaking or if I'm getting paid for, uh, sponsorship for my meetup group, it all goes through that company structure. So, so let's take a step back. Um, why real estate? Because there's, look, there's so many places where you can put your creative outlets, you know, web design, you can go down the list, right? Why, why real estate? So I was in IT for four or five years. Um, kind of just, uh, I went to one year of college, decided that that wasn't, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, kind of fell into a job in IT. I thought I was going to do that um, long term. My dad was in IT. All my friends were in IT. Um, and I enjoyed it. I mean, uh, it was something I was good at and for the most part had fun in. And then I got laid off like everybody else did in like 2003 or so. And, um, and then I really had to decide like, okay, do I, you know, my dad survived a ton of rounds of layoffs throughout his 30 year career. And all of my friends got laid off and they're all, you know, scrambling to go find jobs. And um, I was like, I, I don't like that idea of this being out of my hands. And so at the same time, my wife and I were moving down to Phoenix for two years to be closer to my brother and their new family. They just had a daughter. And so I was like, hey, uh, right before I left, a friend of mine handed me Rich Dad, Poor Dad and was like, I, I read this book. You should check it out. I was like, yeah, OK, I, you know, kind of dismissed it a little bit. But I read it on the way down to Phoenix when I wasn't driving the moving truck um, when my it was my wife's turn to drive. And I read through the entire thing on the way down there. And I was like, new city, new me. This could be something that um, that can answer all my my questions and, and all of my concerns about corporate life. And do I want to go back into IT? And so I'm kind of like at this point, I'm kind of too sunk in to do anything else. <laughs> but the initial thought was, you know, have control over my income, have control over my day, um, you know, I've ran my businesses as like a lifestyle business for a long time of like, I can go to the soccer games and go to, um, go pick up my son from school every day. And I'm not working 80 hours a week and just, you know, just trying to stack as much money as possible. I'm literally just, you know, having freedom in my day and real estate is one of the best uh, mechanisms for that. And so, uh, and so, yeah, it, a lot of those things speak to me and where I was at and where I still am. And every now and then I reevaluate, like, is there anything else I could do? <laughs> and I don't think I'm qualified to do anything else besides exactly what I'm doing right now. So real estate is certainly a great vehicle to creating much more of a lifestyle that I think most people want to live. Um, I think the big question always is how do you enter the real estate market? Right. And the, the, the biggest way that you enter is by putting a deal together, right? So you have a book, Finding and Funding Great Deals. Um, and so what makes a great deal? A great deal is, um, and, and this is kind of, it's kind of subjective because everybody has a different business of model. Course. They yeah. have a different budget. Uh, they have a different goal. And so a great deal is something that meets, you know, meets your metrics uh, in your formulas of whatever your business formulas are, if you're a fix and flipper, um, you know, they, they fall within your, you know, 80% rule or 70% rule or however you're, you're, you're using it. Um, and then also something that you know, falls on, under your time budget kind of falls like in, in all of your buckets. So if it's like a good deal money wise, but it's going to require you to work a hundred hours a week, that may not be a good deal for you. You know, even though the money's great, the money's there. Um, and likewise, there are definitely deals where you don't make a lot of money for, you know, reasons outside of your control. 
Um, and but you learned a lot through that, and you uh, and you're actively making sure that you're not falling into those you know mistakes again. So I I would consider that a, a great deal as well because you're you know those lessons sometimes don't come for free, um, but ideally you're making money you're using your time budget and you're, you know, you're well within your business model. And so it sounds kind of generic, but it is very subjective of what a great deal is. And it's just going to hit all of the things that are going on in your life. So uh, addressing that all, there's all the things that are going on in your life. You're, you're trying to select a deal. Let's say you've narrowed down to kind of your asset class or, or what you want to get involved with, right? What's the primary factor that's driving uh, a potential site selection? So this could be an existing site, or maybe you're looking on the um, uh, development side. What what is it that you really look at? Um, we I, I like to look at things that have uh, a good amount of upside and potential in uh, and basically forcing equity. Um, it it kind of just has to be there. Um, I could go buy a deal that's, you know, a hundred dollars a door cash flow, but that doesn't excite me by, by any stretch. It, and I could buy that for retail price. I can go find a turnkey provider um, and then have a safe place to like park money. And that's just, that doesn't excite me at all. Um, I'd rather have an opportunity to, you know, first of all, help a homeowner um, or uh, whoever I'm working with on the other side of that deal. And then also, you know, make a win-win where I'm helping them. And then it, it's also fitting my metrics of, of, of what we're doing. Uh, a lot of that is um, forest equity, which is basically having, you know, a house or a site where there's a, there's a lot of fix up needed or the, the existing home is not meeting the, the uh, you know, the, it's not meeting its full potential. It's, it, it, you know, it could be a 600 square foot house on a lot that could build three, you know, build a triplex or something like that. And that single, you know, that single home isn't filling a lot of need, but now we can go in and, you know, sell it to a developer um, or eventually develop it ourselves into, you know, the maximum potential for that lot. And so that I, I like those kind of deals just because they're creative. You're, you're dealing with a lot of numbers and you're, um, you know, fix up and schedules and what is this going to look like? What is this going to look like money wise? And, um, you know, what is the project just going to look like at the end? And, um, and I, I like all of those aspects of those deals. And so I go hunt down, you know, run down houses or lots and houses that have, um, zoning that's underutilized. And I think that that's, um, just, just where my head's at when it comes to that. So you touched on, uh, developing, uh, and and buying an existing asset. So for a lot of our, our listeners and a lot of the followers that I talk to on a regular basis, many of them uh, are kind of wondering, sh- should I consider developing a project? And as somebody who, you know, we work for a development group, right? On the commercial side, office, industrial, et cetera. Um, could you touch on some of the challenges of developing a project? Because I think there's a lot of... Um, myths about how easy development can be sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I can't speak much to the, the commercial development side because I still am pretty in, entrenched <laughs> in, uh, in residential, but residential development has, um, it has a lot of in, interesting things that, that go into it. And one of it, uh, you know, one of the things is basically um, knowing the insides and outs and having a good relationship with an architect um, who knows exactly what could be put on lots. And so if you have a good relationship with a kind of an outside source like that, like, I don't know, I can give somebody a lot in the zoning and I don't know exact setbacks. And I don't know, you know, a lot of those things, but I've teamed up and kind of offloaded my brain to the person who knows that and can turn around and say, Hey, here's the maximum potential of this lot. And then that way I have the most information possible when I go back to that homeowner, or I'm going to negotiate or I'm putting it under contract of maybe we're catching something that our competition isn't. And especially when, um, when zoning changes, like Denver had a big zoning kind of redistribution and now ADUs are, um, allowable in a lot of places. That's an accessory dwelling unit and, um, and a lot of just zoning changes. So 
you used to be able to put, you know, 10 units on a certain type of lot. And now it's only like seven or something like that. And so knowing these things and, and, and obviously the other way you, you used to be able to put three uh, on a certain lot and now you can put um, seven. And so those numbers change. I can go buy properties, just face value right off the market and still sell that to a developer because the numbers are still there. Cause now those numbers went from three to seven. So knowing some of those things is a huge advantage in inside of this. And especially if you're, if you're ever wanting to wholesale um, deals to developers, not a lot of developers are going off market for deals. They just have a couple agents that they work with and um, it's a little bit inefficient because they're only catching deals that come on the market. If you can go, you know, go into a place that's just been recently rezoned, there's a good like six month opportunity there before people catch up to, uh, to get those units under contract, sell them to developers who can make the most out of them on the actual pure, pure development side. um, If you're looking at like fix and flip versus building or pop, you know, popping a top of a house versus building, building is actually um, so much easier because you're not dealing with existing infrastructure and trying to work around that. I, I'm not working with like a, you know, 1910 built house and trying to build off of that structure <laughs> in, in any way. I'm not trying to pop the top and, you know, deal with all the stuff that's happened in the last 110 years. Um, building new is kind of, you know, you scrape the foundation, you have a whole just build up from the bottom and it's just so much easier and a lot less problems and surprises than uh flipping and um you know popping the top and adding additions and stuff like that so development on, on the retail side is is um it is easier than you think but at the same time there's there's just as many moving pieces that i'm sure <laughs> in commercial development so so you've developed your property right let let's say that it's it's been successful you read anson's book you, you know what you know what to do and and you get to the point uh, where things are in place. Are you typically a proponent of the long-term hold or are you much more of a, you know, a short three to five exit period kind of investor? I've, I've historically been the short investor, just like today money and then move on. And I'm not, um, but uh, in the last probably year and a half or so, I've been a bit more, uh, I guess my mind's been, changed. Uh, I've had friends who have been telling me just hold on to every project for years and I haven't listened to them. And I'm I'm starting to listen to them now of um, <laughs> whether we're fix and flipping to hold or we um, build up development isn't something that we've done yet, but it is a huge, uh, it's a huge upside. I have a lot of friends who are, who are kind of in that space and I see the pluses of, uh, of that basically building out turnkey for yourself and then holding. And so I've been on the short, you know, the short term cash side, and now I'm shifting my mind slowly over to the, the long term hold side. So where we're talking short and long term, the thing that's going to come up is, you know, a large portion of your book, which is financing a deal. And um, when you're talking about deal financing, are you much more of a short or long term deal financer? Um, and again, in the past, very much short, uh, private money loans and hard money loans that go for six months to a year, um, try to be in and out of the project as quick as possible so that you can maximize your, your returns and you're not holding on to, you know, 12, 14%, um, APR money, which gets expensive pretty quickly. Um, but now, uh, we have fully, uh, embraced the Burr method. Um, so by, uh, buy, renovate, uh, rent, and then re um, refinance and repeat. And so on that, on the buy side, we are using um, hard money or private money. And then within anywhere between two to six months, we are refinancing out to long-term um, DCSR or um, portfolio type loans. And so we, we utilize both methods because the per, on the purchase side, we have to be super fast and we have to be able to pay in as much as close to cash as possible. And then on the exit side, we, we, we can't hold that money forever in cash flow. So then we have to convert that debt over to the long term. 
And so we, we utilize both methods for the, for the one property, which is a, uh, which, which is a cool way to do it. Cause we can close fast. We can close like cash. And then six months later, we can be into a long-term, you know, debt service loan or a portfolio loan. And um, just because those move too slowly on the purchase side. So we have to, you know, we have to do both basically. Look, the most successful investors are always nimble as the, uh, the, the seas change. And, um, you know, you're certainly a successful investor. Do you think that your, your change to much more of a long-term hold method has been primarily driven by the high interest climate? And if so, can you touch on high, how high interest rates are kind of changing the world in terms of uh, real estate financing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my mindset started to shift like right at the beginning of 2022. I, well, when I started putting plans into motion to, um, to invest out of state in order to you know, capture the mo- most amount of cash flow, basically. Um, obviously, the pandemic hit. Things were a little bit up in the air. Um, so my, my plans got delayed for at least nine months or more. And so, um, so at the time, interest rates were still like crazy low. And uh, in- inventory was super low and you know, competition super high. And so we're still dealing with that climate when I got started into long-term um, short term's kind of always been this, the, the same amount of money. Uh, the money gets easier <laughs> when dealer deals are hard, hard to find all of a sudden, you know, hard money lenders are like down to 8% and, um, throwing, you know, basically throwing money at you. Uh, and then when deals are super easy to find, then, you know, obviously the, the reverse happens, but, um, but yeah, it, when it comes to interest rates, we've, we've, we've been in both climates during our journey in long term. Um, obviously we've had to just retool some of our numbers to kind of just figure out, okay, these 6% loans are now, you know, closer to 8%. What does that look like for cash flow? And does everything still make sense? Can we save money on the purchase and force equity, you know, here? Um, can we still just burr our money out and move on to the next one and still meet our numbers? And so for the most part, those answers have been yes. Um, there's been a few deals where it was a deal you know, a year ago, and now it's not at those same numbers. Um, so we're just, um, we're just trying to nimbly move around that climate. I personally think, you know, having been licensed and in investing since 2006, that this kind of five, 6% interest rate is probably more normal. And the two, 3% was extremely abnormal. And then where we're at now is going to kind of calm down to a sustainable normal um if you locked in at you know if you refied at two and a half percent those people are not going to sell their homes like anytime soon <laughs> and so we, we are running into a little bit of that as well you know so as a off-market buyer you know we're running into people who are like hey i refinance like you know to you know 2021 at at eight, 2.8 percent like i am not moving ever. <laughs> and so you do run into people like that who are holding on to their really good interest rates. Um, but, you know, life happens and people still need to sell uh, for one reason or another. And so we're catching those people still. But it is a very interesting environment having gone through, you know, uh, the downturn of 2008, short sales, you know, a huge run up for 10 years. And then now we're running into, you know, interest rate issues. But we still have really low inventory. So it's really driving, you know, it, it, it is weird. Like prices should be coming down a lot, but they're not. And so we're, we're, we're in a very interesting market and it's interesting to live through for sure. Yeah. We, I mean, we've certainly had two historically abnormal markets back to back, right? You had the golden box period of loans that we had previously. And now we're in a, uh, a very illiquid market in a lot of ways. Um, and so, it's no different in many of the other industries and folks we talk to on this podcast. It's no different than the folks that are in the manufactured home space, no different than some of the folks we're talking to in the commercial industrial space. So you're telling a tale that that's definitely, uh, definitely out there. Um, so on that note, so we're kind of in two very different spaces and we come from one that was a, a very historically abnormal space now more normal, but illiquid. What do you think if, if you're going out there besides reading your book, of course, um, what is the number one thing you would tell someone who wants to get into 
the residential investing space? I mean, my depending on where you're at in your life, my my first suggestion is usually like if you're young enough and if you're um, and if your situation allows it, I think that um, the house hacking method is probably the best way to enter into residential real estate. Um, I'm, you know, mid forties and I have a kid and dogs and married and, you know, nobody's gonna, nobody in my household is going to want to go move into a duplex and rent out the other side. Um, so, so I'm very aware of those things, of course, but, um, so, you know, that is my number one option, but if you, but if you can't, you know, for whatever reason, you don't want to do that. Totally fine. Um, I would suggest, uh, going into a project where it meets your goals and it maximizes cash flow. And so right now, a lot of that is, you know, buying a, um, you know, buying a place in a very flexible market where you could either short term or midterm rent that property and um, maximize the cash flow that way. And then that way, and then obviously have good numbers to where if you have to fall back on a long term tenant, um, then the, the deal still works. And so you're not, you're not shooting the moon going for a short-term cash flow, and then the regulations change and then it doesn't work as a rental or something like that. So you're being very smart about where you're buying and what those numbers look like to, to kind of hedge all of your bets. And so if, um, you know, if, if you want to short-term rent a property, the regulations change. Now you can go to a midterm or room by room method, still maximize as much cash flow as possible. Um, worst case scenario, that long-term rental should still cash flow and st- should still be a safe investment. But I think that now it seems like there's more options than ever to have different plans to fall back on so that your first investment or your 10th investment or your 100th investment is just a little bit more safe than you know a one method, a one exit strategy type thing. So um that that's usually my second piece of advice if you don't want to have roommates or share your space with other people. <laughs> hey, look, that's great advice. Uh, I I think it's rare when when you're young to have that much freedom, and certainly we should all take advantage of it when we're young. When you get a little older, there there's you know wife and kids, and you know maybe your mother in law lives upstairs, and you just you can't you can't have that same level of freedom, so you have to try different strategies. And sadly, we're moving on to our final four questions. So um, they're they're good ones, but, you know, we'll have to have you on for more advice maybe going forward. But um, question number one, which we ask everyone, is 10 years from now, what do you you think will have changed the most about the commercial real estate industry? Um, so for commercial, I think, I think two, I have two things in mind, even though I'm not a commercial guy. So take that with a grain of salt. And and you know what? I I consider, (laughs) I consider residential folks who are doing development and multifamily commercial as well. So, all right. I appreciate that. (laughs) I'm in the club. (laughs) Um, the first one being like, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of initiative right now to turn office space into residential. And so, um, I know Denver just released a report on what that looks like for, you know, our downtown corridor of um, how much office could be converted to residential. Because we, at least here locally, and I know in a lot of other markets it's the same, we have a shortage of housing units. And so, um, you know, at one time we had like 50,000 people moving to Denver more than we had housing units, you know, being built. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um so I think that, that that could be very interesting where you maybe have a play or an opportunity to get in front of that um, and maybe buy office while it's down and then be able to flip that into residential, you know, that's up. Um, that could be a very interesting thing. And then um, another interesting uh, thing that just kind of bounces around in my head with people that I'm talking to is uh, kind of the mass timber movement. and um, a lot of development being looked at for the sustainability of mass timber. And if you're building something that's under eight stories or six stories, how you can still do that without um, concrete and steel. Uh, It's very interesting to me for a lot of reasons. Aesthetically, of course, it's just different. It looks, it looks cool. Um, But that that's also moving down to, 
you know, I know guys who are building ADUs out of mass timber. And so the kind of this prefab um, timber development uh, could be very interesting for smaller scale, you know, projects. And, um, and so I, I think that we'll see a lot more of that as maybe administrations. And I know the forest service is heavily involved in offering grants and um, subsidies to developers who are building, you know, sustainably. And, uh, and so that, that to me could be very interesting and something that I'm looking myself into. Um, and so, yeah, I think in 10 years, we'll just see more projects that don't just look like, you know, concrete and steel and actually were built in a, you know, in a different way. That's maybe a little bit more sustainable, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think there's going to be a real shift towards more prefabricated uh, homes, offices down the road. And, uh, if I were investing in something now, that certainly would be a, 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 a good option. So thinking instead of the, the past or thinking instead of the future, let's go back to the past, right? Now, you've had a great and successful real estate career, but let's say you could travel back in time and you could tell yourself, say, young Anson, this is, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should change going forward. What would be your tidbit of advice? And that would be uh, definitely two things. One would be um, house hack. <laughs> you're, you're, like, I, I, I think that we could have gotten, you know, kind of a big jump start on buy and holds if we started there. Um, you know, back when I got started, I had been married for three years um, and we had a ton of flexibility. And um, and we could have bought, you know, a fourplex in Denver for, you know, 300000 or something like that. And now they're worth, of course, 900 or a million or more. And, um, and so I'd say, Hey, like slow down, like buy something permanent that you can, you know, that will cover your, you know, your monthly expenses. And then when you're ready to move on to that, that family home or whatever, um, you now have a, you know, four unit asset that's, that's doing something for you. Um, that would have been my first suggestion. Um, second would be to hold, um, kind of like my, you know, the friends that I've been talking to for a long time, they're just like, like hold as much as possible. Um, especially a lot of the stuff, a lot of the projects that we flipped in 2008 through 2011, um, just that kind of equity cushion alone by now would be, um, you know, a, a huge net worth changer. And so I think that every flipper I talk to gets to a certain point where they go, I wish I held everything. <laughs> and of course you may not be able to hold everything, but you could have certainly held a lot more than you did. And so, um, so that would be my advice to, you know, young Anson for sure. Look, there's, there's certainly a lot of flippers that feel that way. And there's certainly also a lot of holders that sometimes wish they exited. So uh, uh, we, we, we live in a world where, you know, the grass is always greener, right? So always, always in terms of in green pastures, one of the most important things to look for is ways we can learn. And I'm a big fan of readers uh, and a reader myself. Um, what would you say, besides your book, of course, is <laughs> the book that influenced your career the most? Um, I, I, you know, my, my origin story is very basic for real estate, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I feel like that that's... It's a classic, yeah. yeah. It, it's a classic, but I'm not going to like... Um, that, that's not going to be my number one recommendation. Um, it, I think it's a great, um, gateway drug to real estate <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. But, um, yeah. one of my, you know, one of my favorite books that I've ever read and it, it's applied so much to my life and real estate, um, or my, yeah, my, my business and my life is, uh, the obstacle is the way by okay. Ryan holiday. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to. So I'm going to recommend a uh, stoicism book for, for business. Um, but I feel like in, especially when things are changing and shifting, um, you know, having that kind of right mindset so that you're not emotionally reacting to the insanity around you um, has been a really good grounding. I, I call it like an operating system of like, and I like, I overwrote like a bunch of things that weren't serving me with kind of a philosophy of, uh, from the book, like, you know, that the challenge is the journey, like, like the things that you overcome, uh, is, you know, is the important part. The lessons that you learn through that is the important part. And then, uh, being able to, um, 
act and not re- react to everything. And so like if interest rates are falling and your retail real, real estate business is, you know, is dying because buyers aren't wanting to buy and sellers are unreasonable, um, it could be really easy to spiral into, you know, you can spiral and tank your business. You can make really rash and wrong decisions. You can get depressed about, you know, the current state of the market or, you can have tools inside your brain to help you overcome those things and actually see things a little bit more rationally and a little bit more um, objectively, I guess. So look, there's a reason why uh, meditations by Marcus Aurelius, right? It's still a a bestseller, even uh, what is it? 2000 years after uh, (laughs) a long time. So um, last, the last question we always ask um, is, the next person um, in the world that we should go out and reach out to. So is there a person that has influenced you that we should reach out and have on the podcast? <clears throat> yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, one of uh, one of my, you know, I run a, a local networking group in Denver um, for the last 10 years. So I have a really good, um, you know, opportunity to meet hundreds of investors every month, which is really, um, which is really beneficial, of course. Um, one of my friends here in Denver, um, <clears throat> Nick Cooley, he's been doing uh, pretty good stuff with, um, with development out of state. Um, and, uh, and a lot of things inside of Denver of um, his, his own kind of Burr portfolio, he was buying, um, he was, he was holding all the Denver stuff that I was, <laughs> I was flipping. And so, um, so he has a really good uh, mind around those things and he's, he's just doing cool stuff and he's a, you know, he's a good friend of mine. And, um, and, and I think that he, he could be a good asset to your listeners on the things that he's doing inside of development and inside of um, residential holding. So, Hey, well, we're going to have to get his contact information from you. I'll get it to um, you. No problem. But besides his contact information, what's the best way for somebody who's listening to the podcast who wants to reach out and <clears throat> get a little bit information about you or about Anson Property Group? Sure. Where's the yeah. best place to reach you? I think uh, I always point people back to uh, Bigger Pockets. So if you go to biggerpockets.com slash users slash Anson, you'll find me. Um, you can send me a DM through there. If you don't want to do that, you can find me on Instagram at Young Anson um, or on uh, on YouTube or on Facebook. I'm, I'm on both of those places as well. But yeah, reach out, send me a DM, send me a message and um, see how we can help each other. If you need, if you have any questions, just let me know. Anson, thank you so much. We learned a lot and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure our listeners are grateful as well. So thanks, Gordon. Thanks again to Anson Young. We appreciate the insights he shared today. And if you enjoy the podcast, please give us a like, a five-star rating, or review. Your comments, interactions, and subscriptions truly matter and help us continue to provide quality guests. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Gordon Lamphere with The Real Finds Podcast. Thank you for listening.